Amen. We serve a great God, do we not? Uh, thankful to be here this morning. I was glad when they said to me, go to the house of the Lord. And I'm thankful to be here. Just a few announcements. Uh, you can see there that that number for the pray and go, it just keeps going up and up. And uh, we keep praying. You keep praying for the folks that go out. Remember this evening, 6 o'clock is the church-wide Thanksgiving meal. And... Uh, Church has the meat and the dressing, and you all provide the sides and the drinks and the desserts. Do I get amen on dessert? Amen. Oh, that's the most enthusiastic I've heard y'all in a while about that. Okay. Uh, remember that uh, Wednesday evening ministries will not meet this week. There won't be a fellowship meal, uh, school break, break for Thanksgiving, etc. Um, December the 5th, Sunday the December the 5th, there will be a congregational meeting in here at about 10.50 for the purpose of nominating and electing elders. You're free to nominate anyone that you would like uh, according to the confession. you got to ask them before you nominate them. In other words, you can't just put them on the spot from the floor and make them decide uh, at that, in that instance. So if you want to do that, if you have somebody you want to nominate, you can talk to David or to Linda about it as well. December the 8th, Wednesday night, December the 8th, is plaid pizza and pie, a little family feud, and uh, some and games will be going on. And as I said last week, the, the Palm to Tate of plaid will be there, and he's going to uh, lead us in our family feud and, I guess, tell us secrets about plaid. Um, also, I want to lift up the new hour daily breads are here. They begin... Uh, on December the 1st, you can find them at the rear of the sanctuary near the doors or in the administrative area if you'd like a copy of that. And I encourage you to do that, to have your daily devotionals with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are there any other announcements that we need to make this morning? All right, our next catechism question is, what else did God create? Last week is... What did God create? He created, he created us in his image. He created us male and female. And what else did he create? All things by his powerful word and his creation was very good. And everything flourished under his loving rule. He is our sovereign God and he rules over us in his love and in his grace. And you can see uh, the scripture references there. And now may the Lord, uh, may the peace of Christ be with you. As we come before the Lord, it is good and right that we confess our sins as we enter into his holy presence. This is from the 145th Psalm. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He hears their cry and saves them. Let us now pray together and confess our sins to our Lord and God. Holy Lord, I have sinned times without number and been guilty of pride and unbelief, of failure to find your mind in your word, of neglect to see you in my daily life. My transgressions and shortcomings present me with a list of charges against me, but I bless you that those charges will not stand against me because they have been laid on Christ. Lord Jesus, capture my heart, conquer my sinful desires. Give me the grace to live above my sinful thoughts and attitudes. Bring my thoughts in subjection to your word and your will. In Christ's name, amen. In the name of Christ, we are forgiven. Amen and amen. Let's stand together and join in our call to worship. It comes from the 100th Psalm. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. 
We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give, Give thanks to him. him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Lord, you are good. Your love is steadfast. And in that covenant love, Father, we come before you this morning and we want to enter your courts and give you the praise, honor, and glory that you alone deserve. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's remain standing for our praise hymn. It's number 209. This is the day. This pre-Thanksgiving is number 797. Come ye thankful people, come. Remain standing now as we profess together what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our next hymn is number 790, We Gather Together. time now just to have a reminder about our giving and our tithes and our offerings. Uh, this month's Noisy Offering goes to the Loaves and Fishes program of the denomination to the Haiti Hot Lunch program. As always, the offering plates are located near the rear of the door as well as the cans for the Noisy Offering. Uh, some of you choose to give online and that's a good thing. Uh, you can go to the church's website, uh, what is that, youngschapel.org, and you can find the uh, secure giving tab there. It's time now for prayer requests and praise reports, uh, some that were lifted up during the Sunday school hour. And Paul, you and Betty may need to help me sort this one out. It's Effie Hursley. Hensley. Hensley. Okay, in Effie Hensley, and in the loss of her son and daughter-in-law, is that right? And they have a small baby, and she's trying to get custody of the baby. Okay, so let's uh, pray for her as she tries, to, as Effie tries to get custody of uh, of her uh, the ba of the baby. <laughs> Remember the family of Geneva Easter and her passing, and the family of Glenn Collins as well. 
Also, let's remember um, Paul Faust in our prayers. He has, he has COVID and he's dealing with blood clots as well. Also, um, you know, as the holidays are upon us, we need to remember those. Uh, it's a very stressful time and a very emotional time uh, for a lot of people. Uh, the suicide rate actually goes up during the holidays. So let's just pray for people that they would seek the Lord and trust in the Lord during this time. Uh, a couple of folks, remember, Ron, uh, Sheila called me last night and they wanted to be here this morning and they send their love to all of you, but they're just really wore down with a lot of health issues. Also, I received an email this morning from Elaine Romano, Joe's cousin up in Pennsylvania. So if you're wondering if people watch on Facebook and worship with us on Facebook, you don't have to wonder a whole lot because they're in touch with me and Elaine wanted to send her love to everyone here and say howdy to Joe. I don't think she used the word howdy. She's, it's just hi, I think, to you. Um, are there any other prayer requests or words of praise that we need to lift up this morning? Miss Jenny. Yeah, um, Paul Faust is back at um, Faust Fitness and he is recovering. He was very sick and the uh, blood clots dissolved. dissolved and so that's a praise. Okay, so that's an update on Paul, with Paul Faust. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Anyone else? Yes, Joe. Just being the Thanksgiving season, I, I want to thank the Lord for all the blessings that He's given me and all of us. We have a, I have a church family that I don't deserve. I have a wife I don't deserve. I have Amen, Joe. <laughs> I have a pastor I don't deserve. I have a, a guy playing the horn. I don't deserve. I don't deserve any of this. No one can be tell me. I don't deserve it. I just want to thank the Lord for his blessings in spite of that, for his forgiveness and his blessings. Amen, Joe. We, uh, we don't deserve our salvation. It is a gift of his grace from the hand of our lo loving Lord's mercy, as is everything in our lives. Miss Tommy. Uh, my girlfriend, Jamie Murray, lost her mother Thursday. Betty Murray was her name. And while they were out Friday making arrangements for her mother, her daughter got a call saying that she needed to get to the hospital, that her dad was passing away. His name was Danny Newby, and her daughter's name is Daniel, Danielle Newby. So the Betty Murray, Betty Murray family and her passing, yes. and Danny Newby did... He passed away as well? I don't know if he has passed away. She did make it to the hospital, but I haven't heard anything if he's passed yet or not. And then Danielle. Yes. Is it newbie? Okay. I'll get all this down and I'll, I'll still get it wrong, okay? That's okay. Uh, Anessa. Uh, Mom did great with her pacemaker replacement. Um, she's having significant eye issues not related. There's a possibility she may have shingles in her eyes, and she's in a mm. lot of pain. Oh, my. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? I have a praise. Lise was able to work this week, so she has bounced back from the treatments. Amen. Anyone else? Everett. Or are you just stretching out that piece of yarn, okay? <laughs> I'm sorry, Everett. I didn't mean to embarrass you. Anyone else? He didn't do anything wrong. He was just, he was just playing. All right, let, it, let us pray. Lord, we come before you this morning, and uh, we do so humbly, giving you thanks 
and praise for your mercy and grace. Lord, we have every reason to, uh, to be like the leper, Father, that came before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and he fell at his feet in gratitude for his healing with heartfelt thanks. And Lord, may we come to you each and every day of our lives with that sort of thankfulness for your goodness to us. Lord, everything we have comes from your gracious hand. Our jobs, our, the homes we enjoy, the food that we eat, even the very air we breathe comes to us by your mercy and your grace. And Lord, we most of all give you thanks for sending your Son to die in our place upon the cross. Thank you, Father, for the gift of faith, the gift of repentance, and the gift of your righteousness that you place within us. Lord, we come once again and we seek your strength and your power and your grace in the hearts and the lives of these people uh, that we have lifted up before you this morning. Lord, we bring them to you in the full assurance that you not only hear us, but that you are willing and you do desire to act and move and answer in ways that we cannot even think of or imagine. So, Father, we give these people to your gracious care. We ask for healing for those who are facing uh, medical issues, uh, such as uh, Paul Faust, Ron and Sheila, Father, and for, uh, for Kay Zinn. Lord, we praise you that uh, Elise is able to go back to work. We just pray for continued healing there. Lord, we pray for people who are struggling, who, are, who will struggle at this season of the year. Father, may they find their hope in you and you alone, that that is where assurance and faith can be found. Lord, we lift up those who have lost loved ones. Bring your comfort and peace to them. And now, Father, help us to remember that uh, nothing can ever, ever separate us from your love. Lord, place deep within us the truth that your love is better than life itself. Lord, thank you, Father, that you have set us free from the penalty of sin. Thank you, Father, for constantly setting us free from the power of sin. And Lord, we praise you most of all for one day, for the day that will come when you will set us free from the presence of, of sin. Lord, we ask now that you take away from us our, our complaining, our whining, and, and our moaning and our groaning, Father, because we have so much to be thankful for. Remove from us our ingratitude. Lord, help us to live a life that reflects your glory. Lord, help us to, to uh, come before you. We ask that you fill us with your grace and with your forgiveness, that we might forgive others as you have forgiven us. And now, precious Father, we close this prayer with a prayer that your blessed and holy Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Dawson. Amen. Scripture reading on this Lord's Day comes from the 100th Psalm. I invite you to take your Bible in hand, check up on me, but I guess you can check up on me. It's up there in very large font on the screen in front of you as it well should be. The 100th Psalm. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he, uh, excuse me, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness to all generations. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. We praise you for your word. We thank you that you have given it to us and that you have blessed us with it. Lord, as we come now... Um, we do so humbly. Help us now to bow down under the authority of your spirit and of your word. Teach us. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, as is obvious at this point, we're taking a break from our studies in Hebrews, and we're going to look at the 100th Psalm in preparation for Thanksgiving. It's hard to believe it's the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. You know, we've, I've had that debate with you in the past. Do you preach about Thanksgiving the Sunday before or the Sunday after? Well, the liturgical calendar took care of that debate for me because we're going to start an Advent series next Sunday, the 28th, Lord willing. So this morning, uh, we're going to talk about Thanksgiving. One of the things that I always struggle with is a sermon title. I have, over the years, it's just hard. Well, how, how do I entitle this? And it was a great, it was a cause of great rejoicing and great thanksgiving for me when I looked down in, in, the, in my Bible and it said there, a psalm for giving thanks. So I was very original and just reversed it and called it a psalm for thanksgiving. Amen? Amen. That was good for me anyway. And as we look at this psalm, we need to, I think I want us to gather our thoughts around two, two main headings. First one is the invitation to thanksgiving, or if you like, it's what we are called to do. And the second one is the foundation for our thanksgiving, or if you like, what we need to know. What we're called to do and what we need to know. So the first then is the invitation to thanksgiving. These, these opening verses of the psalm, it's a picture of the priest welcome, welcoming people as they are on their way to worship. And... Uh, and he greets them with a succession of verbs. You know, make a joyful noise. Uh, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Enter his gates. Give thanks. Bless his name. It's perfectly clear that it's action, right? It's activity that's going on here. Even a child in the second grade could read this and pick out the verbs and say, hey, he wants us to do something. We're to be doing something. And while it would be instructive, to look at each of these verbs, I think it would be somewhat monotonous because when I was studying it and I was going through the verbs, it was monotonous. So why should I put you all through what I had to go through early in the week, right? Amen. Amen. There we go. That's right. So, so just a couple of things here. You know, what do we need to know? What are we called to do? Uh, we see the invitation. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. I've always uh, felt like this verse described me because when I come to the house of the Lord, it brings me joy, and when I sing, it's a lot like noise, right? A lot like noise. Just ask these poor souls who hear me over the microphone and got those headphones on, and when I forget to turn off my mic, it's a lot like noise. And the point, though, is that we come into the Lord's house, it's a joyful occasion. It's a call for enthusiastic and vocal worship, joyful worship. No funeral faces here. Nobody looking like they swallowed something that disagreed with them at breakfast. Nobody needs to look like my horse, or it's my daughter's horse. When I left the house this morning, she had her face over the fence looking at me like, are you going to feed me? 
you know, that big long face, you know, none of that. This is an invitation from the Lord himself to all who seek to genuinely worship him. And this is a call to all the earth to sing, all the earth to shout for joy. The whole earth should praise God. Why? Why should all the nations praise God? Because he's made the nations. He's made the nations to his glorious grace. This verse claims the whole world for the Lord our God. The Lord our God is the sovereign ruler over the earth. And as Paul says, one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's why joyful worship is the only right and the only proper response to the God who sent his son to redeem us. Amen. He sent his son to, as a sacrifice for our sins. He sent his son to take our place upon the cross, to take the punishment that we deserve, to die in our place. He sent his son, the lamb without spot, the lamb without blemish. And in light of all of that, surely we, though, those of us who have been redeemed, by his blood, what should we do? We should sing praise to him. So it's an invitation to that joyful worship. And in verse 4, we see it's an invitation to thankful praise. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. You know, Netflix has this series about the royal family. It's a docudrama, I guess is what you would call it. And it's called The Crown. And Lori likes that stuff, so I get to watch that stuff, okay? And... And it's, and it's been very informative. It's, it's helped me. And one of the things that stood out to me is the isolation of the royal family. They're always guarded. They're always kept separate. They're always behind those closed gates. And the gates are closed to protect the sovereign. And the, they're closed to make the point, you're not coming in here. You're not welcome here. That's the point. The story is told, I came across this week, of a, of a small boy who was standing at the gates of, of Buckingham Palace, and he's wanting to go in, and he looked at, up at one of the guards, one of the policemen there, and said, Please, sir, I want to go see the king. And the policeman said, Sonny, you can't go in. Just be quiet. And the little boy, he became insistent, and he became a little bit belligerent, and he said, No, I want to see the king. I want to go through those gates and see the king. And, some, and somebody overhearing this stepped forward and said, what's happening here? What's going on? And the policeman said, well, this young boy wants to go see the king. And well, the man reached out his hand, put the little boy's hand in his hand, and he said to the policeman, please open the gates. And he opened the gates, and they walked right in. Well, of course, the man that told him to open the gates was the Prince of Wales. And he went right in, the son of the king. In other words, he'd overheard the, the son had overheard the cry of the boy and is able to give him access to the, his father, the king. Jesus, God's son, gives us access to the father. The gates are wide open. Amen. The gates are wide open. It's an open invitation, an invitation that's given right here in this psalm to come in. And it's an invitation not to trample his courts, but to enter his courts with praise. And that's something else I've learned from watching The Crown. There is protocol. You don't go in, you know, to see the king and the queen, or in this, right now, the queen, uh, just any old way you want to. There's some things that you simply must not do. You can't tromp around in there any way you would like. Isaiah the prophet talks about this in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 12. It says there, when you come to appear before me, the Lord says, when you come to appear before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? You see the difference? There's a difference between entering with praise and just tromping around. If you've ever been over to Biltmore, built more house and gardens and seen the beautiful gardens there, you, you know you better be careful where you go, right? And you just can't trample around in there. You know, and if you do, somebody might come up to you and say, excuse me there, there are paths here for a reason, and you just can't tromp around. That's why we have all these signs around here. Of course, you may trample around because you're clueless, and you say, oh, I didn't realize and you might trample around because you're careless and say, sorry, I didn't notice. Or you could trample around because you're just callous. I don't care about your signs. I don't care about your flowers. And the question is, is 
Did you come to trample the courts of God today? Did you trample in clueless? I suppose I have to go because it's Thanksgiving. I'm glad I'm here, or I'm glad you're here, but you're clueless. Or did you come because you're careless? I come, I go, I go, I come, I come here all the time, you know, so I'm here. And I hope nobody's callous. Who cares? Let's get this over with. I want to go home. As Christians, we wonder at this invitation. Enter his courts with thanksgiving and his gate, you know, enter there with thanksgiving and praise. Because we've seen this in Hebrews, haven't we? The curtain has been torn. The curtain has been torn in two. And it was torn in two at the moment of Christ's death upon the cross. And by his death, he's opened up, the writer, tell, the writer of the Hebrews tells us, a new and living way. In other words, that's when the gates were opened on the cross. And when we understand this, it doesn't matter about our circumstances. It doesn't matter about the condition of our health. Health. What matters is, is that our heart is filled with thanksgiving and love and praise for the one who bore our sins in his body upon the cross. That's what's most important. Now, if you're thinking, and I hope you're thinking, I hope you're asking yourself, well, what's the foundation of this joyful worship? Why, do we, why are we here? On what basis do we do that? Well, look at the, verse, uh, the start of verse 3. It says, no. Know that the Lord, he is God. We say knowledge is power. So knowledge is the basis for our praise. If you read your Bible at all, you know that the Bible knows nothing of empty-headed Christians. There are some empty-headed Christians and there is some empty-headed Christian preaching. But it is not from the Bible. The Bible does not endorse such. The Bible is clear. You'll notice here that this doesn't stir up emotions. Um, I mean, emotion is involved, but it's not emotionalism. You know, you can come here, you can come here on a Sunday morning, charge me up, do a dance, spin some plates, get me pumped up, get my emotions rolling. Boy, that was great. And then sometimes Sunday afternoon, you crash and you got to come back and get another emotional fix. No, what the psalmist is saying is, is it starts up here in your head and then it gets to your heart. You know, when your emotions crash, and let me tell you something, they're going to, they will crash. It's what you know to be true from the Word of God that will see you through. You know something, he says, the psalmist says, if you're going to accept my invitation to make a joyful noise, if you're going to, come, be, to become a people that are marked by this praise, by all of this, there are certain things you need to know. And if you don't know them, if you don't know these things, you'll never be able to do this, is what the psalmist is saying. The psalmist says thanksgiving and praise, he's saying it's not connected to your feelings or to your circumstances. If that's what it was, if that's what it's, the basis of it is your feelings and your circumstances, you know, I don't know, it made me think of this, I don't know what those men in the Bledsoe County Jail, the prison, that I went to uh, two or three years ago or whenever it was, and I spent three days with them around those tables. They're in prison there. And men standing around or sitting around those tables singing with joy on their face, some of them with tears coming from their eyes. And they knew that when they left those tables, they were going to all go back to a prison cell for the foreseeable future in their lives. What if we were to contact one of them? How was your Thanksgiving? All of your family there? Did your mom make all the food that you always like the way she always made it? No. Well, then I don't know what you have to be thankful about. If we think along those lines, we've got it wrong. We've got it all wrong. The real foundation for thanksgiving and praise is knowing that the Lord, He is God. Amen. The Christian knows. The Christian doesn't know everything. But the Christian knows this. The Christian knows he took me out of the slimy pit. And this is the 40th Psalm. He took me out of the slimy pit from the slimy clay and, out of the, and he set my feet upon a rock. He established my going and he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to my God. That's what he knows. That's the strength of it all. That's the foundation of it all. That's the basis for joyful praise. If you're still in the slimy pit, if you're still in that miry clay, 
you have no foundation. And I sympathize with you. I sympathize with you when we ask you to sing these songs because you're thinking, what in the world are these songs about? I, I, I don't like the words and I don't like the tune and I don't know anything about them. Well, let me tell you something. Once your feet hit the solid rock of salvation, your lips will sing the praise. Verse 3, it is he who made us and we are his. It is he who made us and we are his. Now, this isn't a reference to the work of creation. This is a reference here to the work of God that creates a people who are his own, a people who belong to him. And what the psalmist is saying is this, our very existence as the people of God, our very gathering here this morning in the name of Christ is an indication of who God is. It is the God who has made us. It is the God who has redeemed us. That's why we were here. Once we were a people, but now we weren't a people, but now we are the people. Once we didn't receive mercy, now we have received mercy. And you say, well, that sounds like New Testament stuff, Dale. Well, you're right. The reason it sounds like New Testament stuff is that it is New Testament stuff. Okay? But Peter, in 1 Peter 2, is quoting the Old Testament to make his point. But you are a chosen generation, a royal peace priesthood, a people who belong to God. Once you weren't a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's the church. Amen. You see that? That's the church. That's the people of God. Hey, your feet on the solid rock? Well, yeah, so are mine. Let's sing. Were you on the miry clay? Yeah, I was, was there, but what happened? He brought me out. Well, he brought me out too. Let's sing. Well, what do we sing? I don't know what we sing, but I know one thing. We better sing, or I think I'll just burst. Amen. That's what he's saying. So the Lord is God, and we are made by him, by the power of his grace. Now, in the second part of verse 3, we are his people. We don't belong to ourselves. We are bought with the precious blood of Christ. We don't belong to ourselves. You, you, when, a Christ, when Christ redeemed us with his precious blood, we became a man of God. We became a woman of God. And God has given us a forever family. And let me tell you something. They're just as funny and just as weird as your own family. And in some cases, they're funnier and weirder. Just look who's sitting around you. Or just look up here. Okay? That's the way it is. We, we're here. God has made us a family. And when you show up at church and you look at each other and say, don't you think we ought to be making some noise or something? After all, I was on the miry clay. Now I'm on the solid rock. And so are you. And I couldn't hear you singing a while ago. What's up with that? We're God's people. We're the work of his hands. Isaiah 61, 3 tells us that we are, God's people, we are the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. You get the picture? You are a chosen race. You are royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a people for his home possession. Why? So he can set you on the self? No, so that you can proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, the, uh, I think it was Kaylee telling me the senior high class talked about witnessing. That's witnessing, proclaiming the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And it's witnessing to him, it's worshiping him when we sing to him to proclaim his, that he's called us, that he's redeemed us, he's brought us into the light. And this is a wonderful verse, isn't it? A wonderful little verse. Know that he is God. Know that he is the Lord. Know that he is the one who made us. Know that we are his people, his pastor. We belong to him. He's purchased us with his own precious blood. All that is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not an occasion for pride. Look at me, the Lord picked me. No, it's an occasion for praise. How could he have picked me? Why would he ever pick me? But what's praise? What does it mean to praise? C.S. Lewis, as he often does, answers that question very succinctly. He says, praise is the spontaneous acknowledgement of what is valuable. The spontaneous acknowledgement of what is valuable. In other words, people praise what's valuable to them. They talk about what they, what, what they value. That's why if you let somebody talk for five minutes, you're going to know what's important to them. 
You're going to know what they value. You're going to know what they're on about. You'll find out what they like. You'll find out what they read. You'll find out what movies they watch. It'll just come out. And, and uh, the psalmist is saying that if you assemble the people of God and they don't begin to praise God in joyful worship, there's a problem because people give voice to what is most valuable to them. Lewis, C.S. Lewis also says, just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it. The psalmist is telling everyone to praise God, and what he's doing is, is he's saying that what all men, men do is they speak about what they care about. You talk about what you care about. Isn't she beautiful? Wasn't that a glorious sunset? Did you get to go up to Cade's Cove and see all those colors? Isn't that magnificent? Have you read that book yet? Have you seen that movie yet? How about those jackets? Yeah. How about those vols? We praise. Praise is spontaneous and it's voluntary because that's what we value. Finally, we need to know not only that the Lord is God, but we need to know that the Lord is good. He is good. Moses uh, meets with God up on Mount Sinai, and God comes proclaiming his name there in Exodus 34, and this is what the Lord says. It says, The Lord, the Lord compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. That's the foundation that the psalmist is talking about that we need for thanksgiving. Why give him thanks? Verse 5, for the Lord is good and his love endures for a little while. His love endures until you get home and you feel bad uh, this afternoon. No, it says his love endures forever. It's a steadfast love. It's his covenant love. It's his faithfulness to all generations. A covenant of love by God that he saves us and he preserves us and he keeps his people and he causes generations that have yet to be born. They will praise his name as well. It's the sovereign grace of God that will not let us go. Amen. It's the sovereign grace of God that affirms his faithfulness to us in spite of our own sinful wanderings. And you know what hit me in the face this way, week, like stepping on the end of a rake, and it just comes up and whack. What hit me was this, is how self-absorbed my thinking about Thanksgiving really was. How it was really all about, you know, where am I going? Who am I going to see? What are we going to eat? What's going on with that? Man. And then I thought, what if all my food, all this food was taken away? Take away the people. Take away the freedom. Take it all away. What would I sing about? What would I say? Who would I get together with? And then I thought about the guys in Bledsoe County Prison. You know, what are they doing? They're not doing any of this. And I don't say this to make you feel guilty. I don't say this so that you can go on some guilt trip. I say it to help us understand. I hope you get this. You see, even when our eyes are filled with tears, when our hearts are burdened, when our circumstances frustrate it, when things disappoint us, when people disappoint us, when we disappoint ourselves with what we've done, we may still find God's covenant love, the foundation of joyful worship and thankful praise because it's what we know to be true. You know, in the 63rd Psalm, David's in the desert, and he's being pursued by his son Absalom. You remember back a thousand years ago when we were in First and Second Samuel, and Absalom's pursuing David, and David's holed up somewhere. And then in the middle of this hold up, and his son pursuing him to death, he writes this, Because your lover is better than life, my lips will glorify you. What? Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you, even though my son's after me and he's trying to kill me? Better than what I value most, better than living and moving and breathing. Because your steadfast love is better than life, 
I will praise you. That's totally different than this because everything's going well because the turkey was juicy and tender because I had the desserts I wanted because the people were there that I wanted. You fill in the blank. That's totally different. If all these things were taken away from you and you're all by yourself and you go down here to the food city and you buy just enough for yourself and by yourself because you're separated from your family because you've done something silly or, or because you're out of fear, out of your failure, where is the foundation for thanksgiving in the middle of all that. It's gone, you see, unless God's love is better than life itself. Amen. You know, one of the marks of a Christian is having a thankful heart. And one of the strongest indicators that you're not yet a Christian is ingratitude. Paul writes about it in Romans 1. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. Beloved, the void inside of us is a God-shaped void. It can't be filled by the gifts that God gives you. It can only be filled by God himself. And the appeal in this psalm is universal. It's to all the nations. It's, it's to come before him with joyful thanks and praise. To know, it's here he tells us to know God, to know that he has made us, that we belong to him, that he is good, that his steadfast love endures forever, that he's good even when the days are bad and even when the circumstances and the doubts and the fears that feel like they're going to overwhelm us and consume us. That's when we need the foundation. That's then the only foundation is his word. And that's the way that we are able to say, thank you, God. Thank you. Let us pray. Father, forgive us for loving the gifts that you give more than we love you. Lord, change our hearts, renew our hearts. Grant that we might bow down before your throne, that we might join the nations of the world in praise of you. Because, Lord, we know that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Help us to bow down before you now as Savior and Lord, lest you meet us on that day as our judge. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Closing chorus is give thanks. And I didn't think much about it till this morning, but the words kind of hit me. Give thanks to the Holy One. Why? Because he's given Jesus Christ his son. That's what the psalmist is saying. That's what he's saying. Because of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the weak say I'm strong. Let the poor, poor say I'm rich. Because of what God has done. Not because of what I have done. So let's sing that from our hearts. Let's give God the praise and the glory. Let's have some of this joyful worship. That God has called us to in this 100th Psalm. It's number 170 I think. Yes, 170. Let's stand together as we sing.
Lord, may we truly give thanks and joyful praise to you because of what you have done for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. You have sent him to die for our sins. You have sent him to redeem us from our sins. And we give you thanks. In your name we pray. Amen. Bye.